Hello and welcome to our bi-weekly, which I think means every other week, <laughs> program where we work with you guys on help preparing you for the Utah real estate exam. And I, um, I'm thrilled to be here tonight, and I'm, I'm here with uh, the, the owner of our school, Mr. Dan Naylor, who's, who's doing the uh, technical part of today's program, and will also chime in on occasionally uh, with his opinions and, and uh, very knowledgeable help. But tonight, we're going to be working uh, on so a little bit of definitions on, on loans and mortgage and whatnot, and uh, also we're going to be talking about, you know, uh, debt or uh, loan ratios and, you know, all kinds of fun stuff. You know, we got about 18 questions to go through. And, and once again, you know, the way this program is set up is that we like to come up with questions that we think that you there, there's a high probability actually, uh, you know, are going to need them <laughs> sometime when you're in taking the exam. And, you know, no one can say, well, here are all the questions you're going to see because there's 3000 questions plus or minus in their database. And they have an algorithm that goes in and chooses any particular test for a particular month. And uh, so you never know what you're gonna get. So they have like 10 questions on one topic and you don't know which one of the 10 you're gonna get, but they're all similar because uh, they're written by what they call content experts, which are people like me <laughs> that have been teaching it forever. I started teaching these classes in 1980, and I've written for all the major test organizations. I wrote the whole test for Texas one time, and uh, I, got a, I got that job because I had my boots on when I went in for the interview. Anyway, um, tonight, let's get started right away, okay? And so we're looking at question number one under a mortgage foreclosure. Now, um, foreclosures, you know, in the past in uh, Salt Lake County have been, you know, during the, the periods of time when the market was really developing and we were getting a lot of multiple offers and whatnot, we didn't have a lot of foreclosures, guys. You know, we were lucky to have 10 or 12 a month. Uh, not that we want them. That was a good thing that we had that few foreclosures because it, it speaks to a strong economy that we have in our area. Uh, but since uh, the market has softened a little bit and the interest rates have jumped up, uh, all of a sudden uh, we've seen foreclosures or uh, notices of default, which is the first step in a foreclosures jump up in the 600s. So it's... Um, you know, what that really means is, yes, there are people in trouble on their mortgage. Yes, there were people that uh, probably got some uh, monies from the federal government for various, you know, uh, COVID things. And, and they went out and they bought new cars. And, you know, now the reality of all that is set in. And I know that people have been on furlough from paying their student loans for, you know, almost two years now. So, and that's starting up again. So what's happened is all this is in closing in on some people who probably are a little bit overextended right now. And what that does is it creates opportunity for you to come in and help people. I mean, that's what this business is all about. It's about finding people that have a desire or a need that they need to accomplish in real estate. And then you have the expertise and the ability to go in and help them accomplish that need. Whether it's find other properties or whether it's find tenants or whether it's to find buyers or even sellers, uh, if you have buyers that wanna buy, but you can't find any houses to sell. So anyway, let's look at number one. Under a mortgage foreclosure, which we're seeing more of right now, Kay made the highest bid and got the property. Okay, so this is a verbal outcry auction held normally on the north steps of the Salt Lake City County building. And uh, within 24 hours, Kay had paid the full amount to the sheriff. Now, sheriff sale means that it actually went through court. It was a court-ordered sale. Uh, most of the sales we see in, in uh, Utah are not court-ordered sales. You know, they're, they're trustee sales. And a trustee sale is outside the court system. And uh, this particular one went through a mortgage foreclosure, which required them to go through court. And then a judge had to rule uh, with you know, a ruling and saying, okay, go ahead and sell that property. 
And of course, who would handle that? Will it be the officer of the court, which is the sheriff's department? And so they have sold it. Kay made the highest bid, and he's even paid the money into the sheriff's account that he has for this purpose. What would Kay receive when he paid the money? Are they going to receive a special warranty deed? Are they going to receive a certificate of sale? Are they going to get a bargain and sale deed? Or are they going to get a quit claim deed? Now, when you're approaching a question like this, my friends, you need to look at it carefully because... Um, and I like to read the, the, the question itself twice. I've read this one about three times already over the last couple of days. But uh, under a mortgage foreclosure, Kay made the highest bid and got the property. Within 24 hours, Kay had paid the full amount of the sheriff. What would Kay receive? Looking at these answers, we have A, a deed, C, a deed, and D, a deed. Those three are all the same. They're deeds, right? And then B, a certificate of sale. So if you're going to go, if you're going to be the odd man out or lady out and go for the, the one different one, that would fare you well in this particular question because the correct answer is a certificate of sale. See, what happens with the sheriff's deed, you know, since you went through court and the judge ordered a sale, you know, the, the, the sheriff doesn't own the property. The sheriff can't give you a deed to that property. Okay, the only one that can give you a deed to a property is someone who's in an ownership position. And like I mentioned a few moments ago, most of the foreclosures in our counties in, U in Utah are, um, are trustee sales, which this is not. This is, a, this is a court sale. And there was probably some defective document or maybe you know, some other ex extenuating circumstances on this foreclosure that needed to be addressed by someone in a black robe. And so you get through court and the, the judge says, yeah, go ahead and sell the property. But the judge doesn't own the property either. So what has to happen is now that the certificate of sale has been issued, there is a uh, adjudicated, actually it's, an, in, it's part of the state law, but there is a period of time in which the homeowner who is, who is being foreclosed against can come in and make this right. In other words, they can come up with a bunch of dough and they can, they can pay off the certificate of sale, okay? Which is one way of looking at it. But what, what it is, is they're actually redeeming their property, okay? And, um, but they've got to come up with the whole amount. And maybe they can, you know, maybe they had a smaller loan. Maybe it's only a couple hundred thousand dollar loan on a four, six or four or six hundred thousand dollar house. I don't know. But it'd be foolish if they let it get this far. So this is the answer. It is a certificate of sale. The, 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 the key and tip off on this one is it was right in that first sentence, a mortgage foreclosure. So you need to be familiar with the various types of foreclosures, trust deeds primarily is what we use, but mortgage foreclosures can happen uh, all the time as well. And they are going to be court ordered sales. And so once they have determined what the property is worth by verbal outcry auction, they issue the certificate of sale. And now the homeowner knows how much money he has to come up with to reinstate or re redeem his property actually. Um, and if they can't come up with that, uh, then, uh, well, they're going to lose it. But if they can't come up with that, let's say you're on the job, even though all this process is going on in the background, if you can get a good, strong cash buyer on this thing or someone that can get cash and, and buy this out, and they, and they can buy it out during that redemption period, during the certificate, the certificate of sale period, um, then uh, the homeowner can make some money, you can make a commission, and, and the buyer can probably get a pretty good deal on a property. So, and it, it will show that there was some legal problems that the buyer had, but it'd be much easier getting those uh, legal problems taken off your credit than it would a full foreclosure. Um, and so if it went through the full foreclosure process where a deed is actually issued, which would be a sheriff's deed in this case, um, you know, then that, that's going to be a little harder to clean your credit up on. Just some things you'll learn. And uh, remember, this is all about blessing lives, helping people, and making money. <laughs> and the both, both those go together. Number two, please. Number two is a person who uh, pledges a property in exchange for a loan is who? Well, 
okay, we have mortgagor, mortgagee, grantor, and grantee. Now, when you see grantor and grantee, this, these are people that are transferring your property, usually with the deed of some kind. And the grantors, the ORs, are always the givers. They are the givers. The grantees are the receivers. So um, if a, a person got um, a mortgage on their property and they're pledging that property, uh, you know, this, this, you know, they're, 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 they're going to be a giver of a lien on that property. Okay. Now you might think, well, no, the loan, the loan was given by the bank. Well, no, that's the person who provided the money and what they wanted was collateral in order to secure that loan. And so what happens is uh, they become the mortgagor and the person that received that pledge of that property uh, is the mortgagee. Okay. And grantor grantee, the, the grantor would be the giver of the deed, which would have to be the seller, you know, or if it's some sort of a, uh, administrative sale, or maybe it's an, uh, an estate and there's an executor. You can have an executor's deed. You can have an administrator's deed. You can have a sheriff's deed if it went through a court system. But, but these are people that are temporarily entitled and just to transfer that property. Okay. So, and then a grantee is a receiver of the deeds. So that would be the buyer, wouldn't it? Okay. Let's look at, so the correct answer to this, of course, is the more mortgage or. Okay, number three, an upfront cost the lender charges to the borrower, usually a percentage of the loan amount that generates profit for them uh, to the lenders and factors into their cost of getting that money or the cost of the loan is which one of these. So it's an upfront cost the lender charges to the borrower. This is how they make their money. Uh, usually a percentage of the loan amount okay, that generates profit to the lender and factors in the lender's cost of getting the money, okay? So it's going to increase the cost to get the loan. All right. Is it a doc prep fee? Now, a doc prep fee is something that the, the uh, county charges. And um, uh, I, I, I'm sorry, a doc prep fee is something that the, the bank charges, and then they pass that along during the closing. And, you know, 150 bucks, sometimes 80 bucks, 100, you know, whatever it is that they feel it costs them to prepare those documents. Okay. Title insurance fees. Well, that obviously goes to your title insurance company. And uh, like any insurance policy, there's going to be a premium paid. And that title insurance fee is, you know, that's the premium for that. The nice thing about um, uh, these types of fees, though, when you're buying title insurance is it's a one-time pay. And it's, it's good in perpetuity. So, you, you know, it's not like insurance you have to pay every month or every year you have to renew your policy. It's, it's a one-time pay. And so that fee is charged at a closing. Uh, the, what we're looking at then is either the origination fee or discount points, okay? Now, discount points uh, are charged according to the amount of the loan, like it mentioned in the stem of the question here. But we're not talking about discount points, particularly at this time, because um, it, it discount points can generate some profit. But but the one where they get most of their profit on the loans that they originate is the origination fee, and usually it's one to two percent, um, you know, or any combination thereof. It could be a little less, could be a little bit more. If it if this is a loan you're refinancing through maybe a credit union and it's a loan that's maybe only a few years old, uh, you know, they may give you a little bit of a discount. I don't know, you know, and so they would charge you a half percent origination fee. But usually most of the origination fees that are floating around on the market the, uh, right now are, are usually 1%, and they could be higher on certain types of loans. Uh, a lot of times the underwriters and the, the nature of the loan, like if it's a VA and whatnot, they'll have some restrictions on how high those origination fees can go. But the, the correct answer number three is origination fee. It's not the document prep fee, that's just a cost that they're passing on. It's not the insurance, title insurance fee, that's a one-time pay, and it's not discount points. Discount points uh, are also charged on the loan amount and they are also uh, increasing the profit for a lender. But what they're going for here is that loan origination fee answer. Okay, number four, please. 
Mortgage insurance will, and will what? Okay, mortgage insurance does what? What is it all about anyway? A, it pays it. Uh, it pays the loan off in the event of, of the borrower dying. Now that's death insurance, and um, it's you know it's it's not done that much anymore. I mean, I don't know, Dan, if you've seen that a lot on, on closings that you've been involved with, but it used to be really popular, uh, you know, back in the '70s and '80s when I got going into business, but. Uh, to, today, uh, you don't see it used that much, but you'd get that from your insurance agent and they would they would put a, a policy in that would protect that. And um, it, 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 unfortunately, part of life is dying. And, and if the person died and you, your home was paid off, that would be a good a good thing. Um, but of course, there's a premium involved with that that you'll have to pay um, in order to obtain that type of insurance. And you'll have to pay it as, you know, as you go forward in time as well. Um, B, protect the lender in the event of a borrower default. Now that was the mortgage insurance, right? Ha <laughs> ha, wait a minute, that's what we're talking about. Ooh, cool, all right. C, okay, make the borrower payments if the borrower becomes disabled. Okay, that's disability insurance. You know, people are much more likely to become disabled than they are to die but a lot of people don't even think about uh, disability insurance. And D, guarantee the interest rate for the life of the loan. <laughs> that that's, has nothing to do with what we're talking about here. Uh, you can't buy insurance for that. Uh, most loans, in, unless they are uh, adjustable rate mortgages, uh, do stay fixed for the period of the loan. And some don't, you know, there's all kinds of loans out there. So the correct answer for this one, folks, as I gave it away, is to protect the lender in the event of default. Okay, that is what mortgage insurance is. Now, if you put 20% down, lenders are very comfortable with that. You know, and, and they, they, they're comfortable with it because they've run the numbers. They've run and analyzed all the statistics on loans, and they find out that people who put 20% down rarely default. People have put 5% down, default a lot. <laughs> People have put nothing down, default even more, perhaps, okay? So uh, what happens is on loans where you put 20% or more down, you know, you hopefully you'll get to a point here in your real estate career, you know, where you might put half down on the house you're buying for yourself uh, and maybe you'll pay it off, you know? But, 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 but the point is, is that... Um, If you put down more than 20 percent or more, they're not they're not going to require mortgage insurance. But if you put down less than twenty percent, or you get an FHA or a VA, now VA it's a benefit, and uh, they do have a fee they charge, but they don't call it mortgage insurance. But um, but your FHA definitely has it, and any conventional loan will have it as well if you put down less than twenty percent. And the whole purpose is they know that's a higher risk. But of course, they require the borrower to pay that premium. And, uh, and, it, it, and that's why they're willing to make that loan. So you say, well, that's a bad thing. No, it's a good thing because if you don't have 20% down, you need those uh, higher ratioed loans in order to get started in home ownership. Now, if you had started in home ownership, let's say three years ago in Salt Lake City, and I bought a little house and put it down on an FHA payment. I mean, you know, in the last three years, that house may have gone up one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. You know, and so you've got you've got some good equity in there, but you're going to have a Dickens of a time getting them to take that mortgage insurance off because they like having it there, even though there's there's been a substantial increase in equity. But there are ways to approach that. And uh, normally it's, it's more on a time basis than it is on the fact that the market went crazy. But of course you could refinance it, but I don't know, that's expensive too. But it's to protect the lender in the event of a borrower default, okay? So, you know, people were very sympathetic to the banks and, you know, oh, well, they're too big to fail and we're gonna destroy our economy and whatnot. But a lot of these loans that were foreclosed on, they had mortgage insurance backed up behind them. And so it wasn't really the banks that were getting stuck with the properties. It was the uh, mortgage insurance companies. But anyway, uh, fun stuff. 
we're now we're entering into the fun kind of market again where you can do all kinds of creative things <laughs> and also you can use your knowledge in order to make things uh, be of more value to your clients. Let's look at number five, please. When you alienate someone, you know, by either bad manners or bad breath or whatever, <laughs> whatever you're alienating this person from, you're pushing them away from you. So an alienation clause, what does it do? Does it protect against illegal aliens <laughs> obtaining valid ownership? Uh, uh, no. Does it ensure that there will be no late payments of principal? Boy, that'd be nice, but no. Uh, <laughs> okay, number five, does it in, ensure that insures taxes will be paid? No. D, protects the mortgagee's position. Now, who is the mortgagee? Is it the borrower or is it the, or is it the bank? Is it the owner? When you, when, who was the mortgagor again? Now, the mortgagor, see, we think backwards on this stuff, guys. Now, just stop and think about it a second. I want a loan on my house. It's all paid for, but I need some money. I have a business opportunity. I need, a, you know, $500,000. Maybe I'll run down and borrow 500 grand against the house, okay? That's free and clear. All right, what does the bank want to give me the money? They want a lien against my property. But the bank can't arbitrarily go out and create a lien against your property. You have to give it to them. So if you sign all those loan documents, creating a lien against your property, and you hand it over to the, to the lender, then you truly are the, the give or. So you're giving them a lien against your property. Well, I wanted the loan. I didn't want the lien. <laughs> you didn't get the loan without the lien. So you had to give them the lien against your property in order to get the loan. And so what happens is it protects whose position? Well, what is it? Alienation clause, like I said, when you push someone away, says that if you separate yourself or push yourself away from the title of that property, then you have to pay the bank off. And there's a whole paragraph. It used to be a small paragraph, and then it got to be a huge paragraph, and now it's a medium-sized paragraph. <laughs> but it's, it's well-tuned and well-thought-out by a group of legal minds that put uh, together a series of, of sentences and uh, paragraphs that clearly indicate that, okay, we made the loan to you. But if you sell that property or do something that looks like you're selling the property, let someone rent for five years with the option to buy or whatever, depending on what the alienation clause says, okay, then you have to pay the loan off, period. Okay, we're willing to give you the, the loan, but not necessarily someone else. And it, it wasn't that way when I started in real estate back in, you know, when I started, you know, way back in the late 70s. In the late 70s, we had a lot of FHA loans that could be taken over by anybody, and they just changed the name on the documents. It was real simple. And those were called simple assumptions. But there is no such thing as a simple assumption any longer. Every assumption is credit qualified, and so they're going to look at every particular buyer. Uh, would strongly suggest that when you get in the business, that you guys get a hold of me and I can direct you to some uh, extra uh, CE credit classes that you need to take, so many of them through our school. But there's a few of them, like there's one that's done by a lawyer here in town that is all about how to do assumptions. Now, anyone has only been in real estate the last five or seven years or so, they, they, haven't, they haven't a clue on how to work loans or assumptions. They haven't had to. Everything was a new loan. And every home was sold with, you know, 22 offers <laughs> and everything was sold $50,000 or $30,000 over the appraisal. So it was interesting times, you know, uh, but, uh, but nevertheless, um, we're entering into a time now where there are literally hundreds of thousands of low interest FHA loans out there in, in the Utah market, hundreds of thousands of them. And every Last one of them has something that is similar to all of them, common denominator, and that is they're all assumable. Every one of them is assumable with credit qualification. Now, I said with credit qualifications. So that borrower of yours is going to have to go in and credit qualify with the lender to get that loan. But my goodness, well, I don't want to buy a house because, you know, I, I don't want to pay, you know, six, seven percent. 
okay, then we'll get you a three and a half percent assumption. And you can need to come up with a little bit more money down to buy down to that, or maybe we'll, we'll figure out some ways to come up with that money on some sort of an interim loan or whatever. It's all about creativity and how to put deals together. But, uh, boy, that's a win-win deal. It's a win-win deal for the seller because he'll probably get a little extra money for his house because it's got that really juicy 3.5% loan on there. <laughs> wow, that's great. Yeah, the buyer has to credit qualify, but that's no big deal, you know, if you're working with real buyers that have real jobs and real credit. There's, there's a moral of that story, too. Don't work with people that don't have real jobs and real credit because <laughs> we work on a commission basis, okay? Number six. I'm excited. Well, thanks, Dan. Thanks for highlighting. Number six, uh, what does a mortgagor not have to pay? Now, the mortgagor, was that the giver of the mortgage again? Yeah, and that is the borrower. Right, okay. So what does a mortgagor not have to pay? Do they have, do they have to have life insurance? No. They're not required to have life insurance. They could have life insurance, but they're not required to have life insurance. So you don't have to pay that one. That's the one we highlight. That's our answer. Do they have to pay title insurance? Oh, absolutely. The lender doesn't want to lend hundreds of thousands of dollars on a property and find out it really wasn't yours. <laughs> or there's a title defect that they need to clear up. What about hazard insurance? Oh, absolutely. The lender wants to be paid off if that sucker burns down. <laughs> it's kind of funny. What, what, well, it's not really funny, but it's, you know, it's kind of funny. We laughed anyway. You know, my, one of my oldest boys hopped on a plane this morning and flew down to Cabo where his house was damaged by a, a strong ocean breezes, you know, anyway, hurricane type breezes. <laughs> damaged his roof a little bit on his house. He had to run down there. I says, do you have any insurance on that thing? He says, oh, it's pretty difficult to do insurance in Mexico. <laughs> it's difficult to do loans down there too. Everyone pays cash. Okay, so what does a mortgage not have to pay? Do they have to pay life insurance? No. Title insurance? Yes. Hazard insurance? Yes. If it burns down, they want their money. Of course, there is no lender on his house because he paid cash for it. And then property taxes. You got to pay all those things, but not life insurance. Okay? So that's a good one. Number seven. Okay, borrower's debt ratio is, is derived by, okay, your debt ratio. Okay, what we're talking about is your overall debt uh, against your income. Uh, so let's look, look, look at these number. Uh, well, the first one, A, dividing one's total debt by one's debt payments, not just what percentage you're making on that debt service. That's, that's not what we're looking for. We're, not, we're looking for a debt ratio. B, um, dividing one's gross income by one's assets. Now assets, um, I've worked with a lot of people over the years. I mean, it's been 45 years. Some of the most challenging were people that had extremely high income, or, or sorry, they had extremely high net worth, but they had a little income. And, uh, you know, they, they had multi-million dollar net worths. But you know, trying to convince a bank to lend them money when their incomes were low was was uh, was a very interesting challenge. Um, there's ways to do it and ways to actually do it where uh, they'll be amazed that you could pull all that together for them. But these are some of the fun things you learn as you get going. Uh, this one, uh, the correct answer is D: dividing one's debts by one's gross income. Okay, we want to look at how much of your gross income is going to be used to pay for debt service. Now, if that's around 30% or so, you know, they like that. You know, if it's around 68 or 90%, they don't like that. <laughs> that means if you get sick or you have a, a slowdown in hours or, you know, we have another, uh, you know, pandemic or whatever, it slows business down a little bit your income might suffer. And so they want you to have a high gross income and that's not already uh, pledged or used to handle tons of debt service. Well, we always make our payments. Well, that's great. But you know, if you could get into a pickle and not, 
So that's what they're looking at there. Okay, it's not dividing C, it's not dividing one's gross income by one's debts. Okay. The, the you know, the, the face the value of the loan. We're looking for cash flow. This is a cash flow analysis, and that's your debt ratio. All right. Answer is D. Let's go to number eight, please. Number eight, um, John offers to buy a home for 210 grand, but the appraisal came in at 205. Which of the following statements is true? Okay. He wants to buy, he's willing to pay 210. Unfortunately, the appraiser says, nah, it's only worth 205. So what's true? A, the purchase price is the value, the purchase price, which was 210, is the value because the buyer and seller agreed to a price in the fair and open market, both being knowledgeable under no pressure. What do you think, guys? Eh, no, it's not it. Okay, uh, B, the lender is going to err on the side of caution and go with the lowest price whether it's the contract price or the appraised price, okay? So even though this buyer is willing to pay 210, the appraisal is coming in at 205. So if, they, if the buyer wants to proceed with the sale, the lender is only gonna base their loan amount on the 205, okay? Which is gonna require the uh, borrower to come in with you know, that difference or maybe the seller will carry it back, or maybe they'll uh, forgive it because, well, you know, we really can't sell a house for more than what it's worth. And appraisals are scientific, tongue in cheek. Uh, so whatever, whatever works here, but that, that's, B is the correct answer here. That's what they always do. They always err on, um, you know, being conservative. C, the appraised value is always the price the lender will select. Uh, no. Um, the appraised value could come up on this particular deal. Let's say it came in at 215. Well, you know, the buyer wants to pay 210. So they're not gonna, they're not gonna lend on 215. They're gonna base it on what it's sold for, 210. So it'll be the uh, whichever is is lower, you know. So it could be the 205, but it could have come in at 215. Um instead of 205, but if it only sold for 210, they're, they're gonna base their loan to value ratio based on the sales price, not what the appraisal came in at. It, it, they're just being the most conservative in all cases. Okay, number nine, please. Oh, oh the appraisal will be re redone, no, I won't. You can always ask them to try to redo it, but you know they're gonna dig their feet in usually. Uh, nine, under the right of rescission, how many days does a borrower have to cancel a mortgage loan? Okay. We have truth in lending and some federal laws that say that if you are refinancing your house, there's a cooling off period. So if it's a refinance on your house, there is a right of rescission. So the question is, is it three days after the contract is signed, five days after the contract is signed, three days before the, con before the contract is signed, or five days before the contract is signed? Well, before it's signed for the C and D is, obviously you don't have a deal, <laughs> you know, you're just still talking. So those are both wrong. It's either gonna be three or five. And if you pick three, uh, you're a winner because it, the correct answer is A. It's three days after the contract is signed. So generally speaking, when you have a borrower uh, that's using um, uh, institutional second mortgages or uh, something that would require a three-day right of rescission, because not all loans have this, you know, um, your, your primary loans that you get on a home uh, in uh, in most cases, a first, if it's a first mortgage, uh, is not subject to this three-day right of rescission. This would be a second mortgage, um, maybe an owner carried second or maybe an institutional carried second. But what, what the lender is going to do is they're not going to, you know, they're going to have all the paperwork signed and then they're going to wait out the three-day right of rescission before they actually fund the deal. Because they, can, they can't fund the deal and then try to go get the money back later if somebody signed that three-day right of, you know, they changed their mind and they rescinded the contract. 
But mostly you see these where the banks are going, or the borrowers are going into the banks uh, or in our community, they do a lot of work with the credit unions and getting lines of credit or other things. And uh, there's gonna be a three-day rider decision on those. Okay. And so, you know, you've got to plan your closings appropriately and make sure everyone is not planning on moving in over the weekend if you signed everything on Friday, because you know, they're not going to disperse the money on that deal until <laughs> after the weekend. So, you know, things you need to be aware of. Things that make you go home on a closing. Number 10. Number 10 says, which laws or regulations require mortgage lenders to provide an estimate of closing costs to a borrower and forbid them from making, you know, paying kickbacks for referrals, you know, to like, you know, real estate agents other people that might be in a position to refer business to a lender. Uh, which laws or regulations require mortgage lenders to provide estimate of closing costs? Is it, is, it, is it the Equal Credit Opportunity, Truth in Lending, Settlement Procedures Act, or federal fair housing laws? Well, you know, all these are federal laws in one kind or another. And uh, the correct answer is C, the Real Estate Settlement Procedures Act. Um, but the Equal Credit Opportunity Act says that, you know, you have to be fair in giving credit to all types of people. Uh, Truth in Lending uh, says that you have the right to know what you're getting into. And federal fair housing laws, you know, usually those are based on anti-discrimination. So uh, I guess your big, your big um, help on this one was the fact that the stem of the question was talking about providing an estimate of closing costs. So wait a minute. So you're getting close to a settlement. So C is, is a great logical choice. The Real Estate Settlement Procedures Act not only outlines what has to be uh, revealed, but also what percentage that they might be off from that. In other words, they have to have an accurate estimate of what all this is going to cost. And uh, they have percentages they have to work with. So the, the lenders get really precise on this because, you know, they don't want to be clipped later by a federal guy coming in and saying, you are way underestimating your closing costs and you're loading them up just before they come in for the closing. It, that's, they're trying to protect the consumers. Lenders do this every day, okay? We do it every, every day. Well, it'd be nice to do it every day, but we do it a lot, you know, because we're working with deals, hopefully several a month, okay? But the, the point is, is that, um, borrowers don't do this all the time. So they're going to make it stupid simple and they're going to make lots of disclosures so that people understand what they're getting into, hopefully. And hopefully they aren't just glossed over and they don't really understand. Um, but part of the key to all this is that you need to understand, not just because you need to pass a test, but you need to understand all these different aspects of closing and you need to understand how prorations are done and you need to understand what costs are typical because you can catch things all the time, you know? And uh, when I am uh, mentoring new people, uh, which I do a little bit of, not a lot, but some, um, if you're real persuasive, but it, it's um, the, um, I usually go to their first two or three closings and I have found so many mistakes. It's just crazy. You know, I went in one, one uh, closing and I'm looking at the settlement sheets. I says, no, this is wrong. Um, and I asked the seller, you, you prepay your taxes, don't you? And she says, oh yes, I hate paying them at Christmas time because her property's paid off. So there's no escrows for uh, taxes and, and insurance. Well, that's a bummer in December when you're trying to get presents out to all the grandkids and everybody else uh, to pay your taxes, you know, $4,000 or $7,000, whatever it might be. Uh, so the county will let you pay them monthly or quarterly. You just go in and make arrangements with them. You send it in. So what happens is normally on a tax proration on a settlement, you know, the, the uh, title company rep says, well, taxes haven't been paid, so we need to charge the seller. We're going to take that money and then give it to the buyer. So at the end of the year, the buyer has some money to pay the taxes. And that's what she did. So I looked it over and I says, 
can we go talk privately for a minute? She says, oh no, you can talk here in front of everybody. Fine, you screwed up on the tax, <laughs> the tax proration. Oh, what are you talking about? Well, this lady prepays her taxes. Oh, she does? Yeah. Now, why did that mistake occur? Really, it was the fault of the agents. Okay, but the agents need to be smart enough to know that there's things a lender needs to know. You know, and a title company needs to know. You know, and so the title reps putting all these figures together, they need to know that there's a renter in the house because we're going to have to prorate rent and we're going to have to uh, transfer a, a security deposit. You know, in this case, this lady was prepaying her taxes. You need to know this stuff. So you need to know the right at, uh, the questions to ask as well. The cool thing is, is that you can earn while you learn, okay? You're not gonna know everything you need to know, but the cool thing is that you will have title people, you will have lenders, uh, you'll have other people that are working with you on this transaction, and no one's gonna let you fall all the way through the safety net and hit the ground. Okay, you're going to be bouncing around a little bit. And so next time you'll know how to do it a little bit better. But in this particular thing, uh, we have a law that says that uh, uh, title, uh, not title, well, but, you know, lenders cannot give us kickbacks. And uh, a few, oh gosh, I don't know how many years it was, <laughs> a few years ago, <clears throat> probably about six. We had a case at the division where, uh, uh, an agent had come in and complained at the division because he found out that the lender he used was giving one of his buddies in the office a $300 per loan kickback, and he was only getting a $200 loan kickback, and he wanted to know if the division would help him uh, get that extra 100 bucks on the last three or four deals he'd done, <laughs> which is against federal law. Anyway, stupid. Anyway. More of that is if you're a criminal, you don't turn yourself in, you know, so whatever, and don't do it in the first place. Number 11, please. Okay, here we go. One way the Federal Reserve tries to control inflation is to, I'm not doing a real good job about controlling inflation right now. I don't know if you've seen the price of eggs lately. <laughs> Lucky for me, I have plenty of family, have, the, have chickens everywhere. But anyway, one way the Federal Reserve tries to control inflation is to A, make money more expensive to borrow, B, increase credit requirements, C, restrict interbank borrowed funds, D, increase lender collateral requirements. Okay. Number 11. What do you think, guys? If they want to slow things down, which one of these things uh, could help slow things down? And, and you know, yeah, granted, some of these things could, like increasing credit requirements might slow it down a little bit. But the, the main one here is they're trying to make money more expensive to borrow. Okay? So that's A. And yeah, the credit requirements, restricting interbank borrowed funds, uh, increasing lender collateral requirements. Um, this is their main thing. You know, they just make things more expensive. They want to... Um, Put the accelerator down on the economy, they make loans cheaper. They want to slow it down. Going for the brake pedal, they want to make money more expensive. Number 12, one advantage a mortgage broker may have other than loan uh, may have over other loan originators is that. Okay, so you got a mortgage broker. A broker is someone that has affiliations with a number of different lenders. Now, some lenders um, are, have more sources for money than others. The ones that have the most sources for money are the brokers because they're working with a dozen different banks or five different programs or whatever. Uh, but on the other hand, sometimes you, know, you need lenders that are more tied into uh, organizations that have deposits where they have their own money to lend. Uh, and uh, it's particularly if you're doing commercial deals and you're doing smaller commercial deals, like you want to finance a veterinary clinic uh, or you want to finance a small strip mall, 
uh, that type of thing. You're probably going to go to a regional size lender, which will probably be a regional insurance company. And uh, Security National Insurance is one of the largest lenders in our state for these smaller commercial properties. They love these four and five and $8 million deals. Um, and so if you're getting to a point in your career where you're working on some of those, you need to affiliate with a lot of lenders, but you'll be, you'll be working with more mortgage brokers. Uh, but sometimes you'll work with an in-house agent as well uh, be, because they have uh, the ability to make loans there. Um, knowing lenders and knowing what programs they have available, uh, particularly uh, first-time buyer programs, grant programs, uh, other types of programs that they may have, uh, or maybe you have an affiliation with a broker who says, well, you know, there's a regional insurance company that, that I know about that, you know, had uh, an extra 50 million they wanted to dump off on maybe two different types of properties. You know, this, this, is, this is all good information to have, but having a good lender on your team is critical. All right, so number 12, what are we looking at here? Well, uh, obviously I already gave it away, A, is the correct answer that may have more loan programs available, okay? If you're working with a broker. A is the correct answer. Thank you, Dan. Highlighting A. Thank you. Um, their underwriting guidelines may or may not be less stringent. That has nothing to do with it. They are exempt for some costly loan restrictions. <laughs> I don't know, you know, the wrong restrictions are changing with the wind, uh, depending on what their mood is and how they feel people are cheating or they are being taken disadvantage of. Their loans are, are solid, or they're, no, I'm sorry, their loans are sold in the secondary money market for primary funding. <clears throat> no, no, they just have more programs available because they have more lenders they're working with. Number 13, please. Okay, one advantage, no, 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 13, a, a loan servicer is paid by a servicer, okay? So uh, once a lender makes these loans, uh, they don't have much, in, you know, like your lender that takes you to lunch and meets with your people and, and puts all the loan together. And most of the time they show up at the closings and close the loans and whatnot. They, they, um, they get paid, you know, for doing that. that's their job. And, uh, but they don't get a portion of the interest. Okay. They have fees they tag on. Remember we were talking earlier about loan origination fees and whatnot. Um, but there's other people involved with this loan after the loan is put into place and that's the loan servicer. And companies like uh, Security National or other large lenders they like to buy a lot of loans, even loans that they don't make because they want the servicing contracts. I mean, once you've set up your servicing department, you know, you got a whole floor in your building, okay? You have all the machines that, you know, get the checks and run them through the little things and, you know, credit everything. And you have accountants looking over everything and whatever else. They could handle 20,000 monthly payments just as easily as they could handle 10, you know, once they get everything put in place. So servicing can be really profitable for a lender if you can get, you know, large quantities of loans that you're servicing. And sometimes they'll go in and buy servicing from another lender, you know, because they know it has a predictable value. Lenders aren't stupid. They analyze everything, you know, and they know that this average loan is going to be kept out for seven or nine years. I bet that's going to change now because, you know, who's going to, move or refinance out of their three and a half percent loan, you know, in favor of getting a six or a seven, <laughs> you know, people are going to remain a little stationary maybe, and maybe not, you know, there's, there's always divorces and, you know, we have another child and we only have two bedrooms and, you know, we have six kids, <laughs> we need a bigger house. So there's lots of things that happen there, but, but so where do the servicers get paid? Well, let's look at our answers here. Uh, a, they keep a portion of the interest paid. That's warm and fuzzy. Hang on to that one. That's the right answer. B, the loan originating lender pays them. No, they're gone. You know, after they put that loan together, they got their money and they're down the road. 
Mortgage insurance premiums, no, that's a whole different gig, that mortgage insurance premium, because you didn't put down 20% plus. Loans, uh, points paid at the uh, loan origination when it was first closed. Now, they keep a piece of the lender, uh, the money coming in. It's not that large, you know, one quarter, 1% one or so is what, usually what they get, you know, somewhere in that uh, neighborhood. It's not something that really affects you and I, but it's something we need to be aware of if you want to be a professional in our industry. Number 14, VA loans are obtained, are obtained from who? The VA, primary lenders, only from mortgage brokers or from secondary lenders. Now, primary and secondary is just primary first mortgage loans and secondary, you know, like, uh, you know, lines of credit and whatnot from a credit union or second mortgages. But, but do they get it directly from the VA or do they work with primary lenders? Well, the VA doesn't lend money, they just guarantee it. So they're gonna be working with primary lenders. Um, and what's gonna happen there is that the, those primary lenders um, sell the loan immediately uh, to other lenders, but the, but the VA guarantees them because of the service that these uh, individuals had made uh, in, for our country and for you and I, uh, you know, to keep us free. And this is a VA benefit. So they're gonna work with primary lenders, B. Okay, number 15, we're talking about amortization. And an amortization uh, has a definition and it, and it means something. So which one of these is an amortized loan, okay? Let's look at them carefully. A, each payment includes both interest and principal. Both interest, okay, so it's a PI loan, principal and interest, okay? It includes that in the payment. B, each payment includes only principal. Well, then how are you going to pay the bank if you're paying only principal? That's paying them back the money they lent, but they want their interest too. Each payment only includes interest. If it's an IO or interest only loan, that's not amortization. You see, amortization has a definition. And the definition is equal periodic installments, usually they're monthly, equal periodic installments that retire a loan over the life of a loan. Okay, so they're equal and you make them out for those 30 years or what, 15 years or whatever they might be and, you're, and the, the last payment will be zero because you paid it off. Okay, so it, it's not B, it's not C. Um, the sum of the payments equal to principal, well, that will pay the loan off, but what about the interest? So A is the correct answer. Each payment includes both interest and principle. Now you can have a partially amortized loan, which would mean at the end of the loan, there's a balloon payment that's going to happen. A balloon payment is any payment that is larger than the normal periodic installments. Okay. Um, got that one. Now let's, let's look at number 16, please. Let's talk about a buy down. Fascinating way to do uh, deals right now. Well, they don't, they don't want uh, a 6% loan. Well, no problem. We'll get you a buy down. Well, a buy down is where somebody, an interested party, usually the seller, because they want the house sold, is paying a amount of money to the lender, the new lender, in order to buy the interest rate down for a short period of time. So they might do a 2-1 buy down. Okay, a 2-1 buy down, let's say interest rates are 6%. So the first year of that borrower's loan will be calculated at 4%. That's a 2-1 buy-down. They bought it down two points from the 6%. So instead of six, you're paying four first year. Second year, your payment goes up because the interest rate is calculated on a 5%. Okay, so that was 1%. And well, who paid that up front? The, the lender did. No, not the lender. The, the seller did in order to do what? Get the house sold, okay? So it kind of gives the borrower a way to work into the loan. You know, I mean, you got 
two points off the first year, one point off the second year, and the seller paid the fee for that. And, uh, and so that's how you get people into houses. Usually they qualify it not on the first year, sometimes they qualify it in the second year, sometimes they qualify it on the first year. This is why you need to have lenders take you to lunch, not because you want nice food at nice places, but although you do, but you need to get the skinny on all the loans are working. Well, tell me about that. I mean, what are the qualifying ratios? What's this? What's that? You know, what's it going to take? So on 16, our answer is B. The borrower pays additional, the borrower pays additional interest at the onset in order to obtain a lower interest rate. Now we say the borrower pays, okay, uh, but really someone paid it on their behalf. And probably it's because they kicked the price up a little higher so that they had enough cash out of this deal in order to buy their interest rate down. And that would be the seller. So, you know, but it is really, the borrower really is paying the additional interest rate because it's all on in their paperwork, but it was paid up front and usually it's paid um, by some other interested party in order to entice the borrower into take, taking the loan. That's called a buy down, kind of cool, okay? Um, 17, please. Which of the following loan types are typically used for a line of credit? Line of credit's where you say, well, you, you, know, you go to your credit union or whatever and say, you know, I need, I need about 50 grand set aside or uh, uh, an open line of credit so that if I need to come in and get the money, I can get it uh, because I do deals all the time. And if I find a good deal I wanna buy, it might take me you know, uh, 50 grand or something to make that deal work. So uh, I want a line of credit. Sometimes they're secured. Most of the times they're secured. Sometimes they're not. If you had uh, a house that was free and clear, you know, then the, the credit unions, or unions will fall all over themselves to give you a line of credit because actually they'll be in first position, you know. Um, but what type of loan typically is used for this? And it's A, a home equity loan. And there are some fascinating things on home equity loan that you can get, read online, watch out videos online where uh, you can actually use them with a system that help pay your house off much quicker. Uh, those are real programs if you get, get in them and stick with them. You know, I've had you know, all my buyers, I probably have three that actually were disciplined enough to get into these fast payoff programs and make them work. But for those three, they have their houses paid off in seven and a half to eight years. Pretty dang cool, okay? Okay, so that's a home equity loan. It's not a purchase money loan. A purchase money loan is any loan used to buy the house. So it could be a home equity loan, could be a purchase money, but that's not what we're looking for here. We're looking for lines of credit. Reverse annuity. Well, you know, these reverse annuity loans uh, usually are for, you know, people that are seniors and um, they need cash, you know, they need to live on. And so instead of just uh, paying the bank, the bank actually pays them every month. There's, you know, and there's a, there's a, a cutoff date, you know, they only get so much money over a number of years, but, but it can really help someone um, uh, pull cash out of their house uh, in, in order to improve their lifestyle. And a contract for deed is any, any contract that, you know, it could be an owner carry. Um, sometimes they're called an installment land contract as well. Okay, and our last question for the night talks about first mortgages. Okay, and it says, a first mortgage is always senior, junior, guaranteed by the FHA or open-ended. Okay. Always. Well, if it's first mortgage, it's always going to be a senior loan. Senior meaning it's for usually in first position because it was first mortgage, right? That's what it said. So the correct answer here is A. A junior loan would be like a, a loan you got later, an equity line or that kind of thing. Uh, they're not always guaranteed by the FHA. Nothing's guaranteed by the FHA. It's all insured. You know, who does the guarantees? Not FHA, VA. Okay. And open-ended means, you know, it has some flexibility in it. 
maybe uh, you can increase, maybe you can pay it off and then come back and get some more money later. There's a lot of cool things out there. There's even some loans out there that uh, are really quite fascinating. If you have money, uh, if you have parents or others in your sphere of influence that have money, one loan that there's some really special loans out there. There's only one lender that I know that does these and they're very popular in many states, but there's only one in Utah that's doing these. And it, it's a special line of credit type loan where uh, it's really fascinating because they could pull money out, use it for a purpose, put it back on the loan, pay it off again, take the money in and out as much as they want. It's, it's, it's really cool. And it's, it's, it's made for wealthy people. That's what it's made for. But if you have people like that and they're looking for some unusual financing, uh, get a hold of me, I'll give you this lender's uh, information. They'll, and they'll take you to lunch and explain it all to you. And that's, there's, there's a lot of cool things happening in our industry right now. Well, that does our, that's it for our program for the night. I, uh, I want you to know that we're always here for you, period. Okay. Uh, what I mean by that is you can call either one of us. My number is 801-556-8000. 801-556-8000 is my direct line. It rings on this phone right here, okay? If I don't answer it, it's usually because I'm working with someone or in a meeting. Um, if I'm available, I'll answer the phone. Do not text me and say, so is it okay to call? <laughs> Just call. <laughs> okay. Anyway, and happy to help. We'll spend a couple quality minutes together on the phone, maybe even five. Who knows? And then you'll understand it and it'll be cool. Okay. This is the perfect time to get into real estate, guys. I mean, I, I know that you don't understand that. But if you ever want to just talk about that, you know, I'm happy, Dan and I are happy to just to share our opinions on why this is such a great time to get into business. Appreciate you being with us tonight. Uh, it is going to be so exciting. You know, I, uh, I was talking to a banker the other day and he says, what, what's with your real estate people? You know, you get your cards all stacked up and all of a sudden you just come in and pay everything off. What's that all about? Says, well, you know, twenty thousand dollar checks go a long way. <laughs> I mean, stop and think about it. I mean, come on, what kind of business can you get into where you can have a forty five thousand dollar month? Okay, with little expense. I mean, just a little shoe leather and hoot spun, getting out there and making it happen. Okay, the opportunity is phenomenal. Okay, but you gotta, you you know, you gotta get started right, and you've got to. You got to work hard, okay? And you got to know what you're doing. Anyway, thanks for being with us tonight. Dan, thanks very much. Always good to see you, buddy. And we will talk later. Thanks, Rick. Really appreciate you. That's what we say in Utah County. Appreciate you. Appreciate you. <laughs> see you guys. <laughs>